Well, I'm going to start in the book of Titus tonight. And I'm a Bible bumper. I like to cover some scriptures, so we're going to do that tonight. Praise God. But first, I want to start with an introduction, book of Titus, so you'll know where we're coming from. When Paul was writing the book of Titus, the introduction here in this King James Version that I use explains the first few verses this way. And here's what it says. Paul was on his way to Nicopolis in Greece, having recently left Titus in Crete. Pay attention to this. This is important. Having recently left Titus in Crete to, set, to straighten out what was left unfinished there. After that work was completed, Titus would rejoin Paul and the Nicopolis. So, Paul's an apostle. He's setting up churches. And there are things that are not done. But yet, he's leaving Titus, a young man, behind to straighten out things that he hadn't finished. And he's going on somewhere else and Titus is going to meet him later. Now, i got one question for you. How many of you believe that this book right here, was not only written to the person that, or churches that it was written to specifically, but it was also written to today's modern day church. Absolutely. It applies to our lives. Amen. It absolutely applies to each and every one of us. God didn't write this book for him, he wrote it for us. That's right. We need this. We need to know what's in here. Amen. Brother talked about it this morning. We need to know what's in here so it can do something inside of us and help us to become what God needs us to be. Amen. I want to read the first five verses, and I may stop along the way because I'm an expository kind of guy. Verse number one, Titus. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. According to the faith of God's elect, that's us, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. The acknowledging of the truth. I can read this book all day long. I can preach it. I can teach it. I can witness to people, but if I don't acknowledge this is truth, guess what? It's just paper. It's just paper with words on it, and it means absolutely nothing. Yeah. I know for years, the first Bible my wife ever bought, I was working on a tugboat making $20 a day. We had the money rolling in. <laughs> and Tim Cormier, for those of you who know him, his dad was a preacher. So I'm on the boat, Mr. Cormier comes to the house. And he's selling these big family Bibles. And Jan bought one. I got home. She said, look what I bought. And I paid X. I don't remember what it was back then. But to me, it was a lot of money making 20 bucks a day. Okay? So I'm going, you paid what? For a Bible? Man, I don't even believe that. You know? But needless to say, today we still have that Bible. Hallelujah. You know, it's still in my house. And if you know Timothy Cormier... He's an anointed man of God. I'm so thankful that that's where part of our spiritual journey started. It goes further back than that. Let's read some more. Chapter, uh, verse number two. In hope of eternal life was God that cannot lie. How many of you know that's the one thing God can't do? Amen. He cannot lie. That's the only thing he can't do. Promised before the world began, but has in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. He says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. How many of you like that? Grace, mercy, and peace. Grace is God giving us something we don't deserve. So we can accomplish what needs to be accomplished in the kingdom of God. 
Mercy is him not giving us something we do deserve, like when your dad takes you out behind the woodshed, but God chooses not to. He said, I'm going to let it slide. It's okay. As long as you repent. Mercy. He's giving him that. And peace. How many of you could use some peace? Amen. If you could put that in a bottle, like water, and sell it, you'd be a millionaire overnight. Right. Uh, could I have a bottle of peace, please? Yeah. Thank you very much. I needed that. Listen to what he tells him. He says, for this cause, remember the introduction. Let I be in creed that you should set in order the things that are wanting. That you should set in order the things that are wanting. Now he's referring to the churches in that area in Crete where he was. But I believe that applies to you and me. That we as individuals need to set in order the things that are wanting in our life. What's not right with me? I'll start with me. I can't point my finger at nobody. Let's pray. Yeah. Father, we're so thankful today, Lord God, for your word, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. Father, for your peace that passes all understanding. And Father, as we bring forth your word tonight, Lord God, I just submit myself to you. Father, I'm just asking you to let me speak as the oracles of God, as Matt prayed earlier. Open people's ears, prepare their hearts, Lord God, that your word might fall upon good ground, that it would take root, Lord God, and grow. And Father, go forth and accomplish that which you please. Yeah. I ask you to touch each and every one in this sanctuary tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Set in order the things that are wanting. I share a little bit with Matt now and then. We, we have a chance to talk, not too often, but every now and then. Mostly it's on the phone. And uh, I said, you know, Matt, for some time I've been struggling with some things. But I'm getting to a place right now where I want to get back to where I once was. Does that make any sense to you? Amen. Have you ever walked so close to God that nothing mattered? No matter what happened around you, it didn't make no difference because you knew God had your back. It was going to be okay. Amen. I drifted away from that. I'm just being serious with you as I can be, open as I can be. But I want to get back to that place. I'm wanting to commit again. I'm wanting to serve God again. Because I know what I had when I gave God my all. Amen. It was all good. Amen. No matter how bad it was, if that makes any sense to you. Amen. It was all good. Because God was walking with me. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 12. Back up a little bit. Let me know when you get there. Give me an amen when you get to Romans chapter 12. Amen. Some people flip the S and I do. I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. Then we're going to go to Titus and we're going to come back here in a little while. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I beseech you, I beg you, I'm trying to encourage you to do the right thing when he says, I beseech you. This is what you need to do. That's what he's telling me. He's trying to lift him up. In verse number two it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. By the renewing of your mind. I believe we had a sermon on that just a couple of weeks ago. Talking about the mind. Renewing your mind. How are you going to renew your mind? Ever ask yourself that question? Anybody other than me? <laughs> How am I going to renew my mind? Right here, and we're going to talk about it, we're going to look at it in Scripture, this book. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, 15 and 16 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Unto who? God. Do we have to impress anybody in this old world? No. Not a soul. I'm going to stop right there for just a minute. Amen. 
I walk in the lobby where I work, and I'm carrying this radio to communicate with the people on the yard. We've got a 38-acre site, and I have to communicate with guys that work with me. So, and there was four or five people in there that had suits on. So I just kind of nodded at them, you know, bidding them a time of day, and one of those guys in that suit, he went, he did this number. And he looked up and down at me, and he turned his head. I'm thinking, wow, I don't have to impress that man. That's right. You know, but he thought that he was a somebody. I don't know about you. I'm glad they got people on corporate ladders, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> they run things completely different than a mom and a pop up in an organization, right? Yeah. yeah. But just because you got a suit on, it doesn't make you a better individual. It, is. it doesn't change who you are on the inside. Right. When I passed to the church in Missouri, they called me the blue jean preacher. They're going, you don't want to put on a suit? No, I don't want to put on a suit. I'm good like this. I'm going to teach you the Word of God. I'm going to preach the Word of God. Mm. I don't have to have on a tie. If you want to wear a tie, that's good. I don't have a thing against it. That's, <laughs> that's you, you know. However you're comfortable. <coughs> but what you have on is not what makes you who you are. Scripture says that God looks on the inside. He look, man looks on the outside. God looks at the heart. Mm -hmm. People look, will look at your clothes. You know, and pass judgment on you just because of the way you're dressed. There used to be a man that came in a church that we went to years ago. He was the town drunk, y'all. That man reeked. The pastor would tell us, if he comes in here and he sits by you, breathe through your mouth and don't tell him a word. Amen. Don't tell him a word. He needs to hear the word of God. I was preaching in a Baptist church one time. And I talked about a man with tattoos and earrings and all this stuff. You know, we go on all kinds of tangents. You can pick something. There's all kinds of stuff out there that you can point your finger at. And I said, suppose this person walked in the door the very next week, y'all. This dude come in. He was covered with tattoos. He had this hole in it, this ring in his ear with a big hole in it. And he, he was interesting to look at. I'll leave it like that. But you know what? We welcomed him into that church. It didn't matter what he looked like. God loved him anyway. Still does. And he loves each and every one of us in here. In spite of who we are, where we are, what we've done, it absolutely makes God no difference. If your heart is right and you're reaching out to him, but here I am, Lord, fix me. Because I can't fix myself. You ever had something you can't get over, can't deal with? <laughs> I've had a few struggles in my life. Y'all have heard Matt tell his testimony many times. He's had things in his life. We all have things that we have to deal with. But what do we do? We do like Paul. We press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Amen. You keep on pushing. You keep on serving God. No matter what comes your direction. Are you going to make mistakes? If you don't want make any mistakes, I want to know how you do it. Thank you. Seriously. Thank you. Because I make mistakes. Praise God. Study to show thyself approved. 2 Timothy 2.15 A workman approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be a shame rightly divided in the word of truth. Verse 16, here's a kicker. But, for, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We can speak death to ourselves. I had my wife preaching to me this week about a particular situation that I was talking, you know, negative about. And she's going, hey, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Say the right thing. What can I say? She got me, you know. That's what the word says. Any of you guys ever have your wives preach to you? That's all right. Don't raise your hand. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> Praise God. 
2 Timothy chapter 3. What are we doing? Over here we're studying to show ourselves approved. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Getting in the book. It's not meant to collect dust. Amen. Study. I'm going to start at verse 13. That's not the key point that I'm after, but that's where I'm going to start. It says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able, is that in there? Which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. So, let me repeat that. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I don't know that everybody in here was raised in church. I wasn't raised in church. Well, I was sent to church. And when I got old enough, I'm going, there's something wrong with this picture. My mom and dad's telling me I got to go to church and they're not going. There's got to be something missing there. You know? So, at the age of 29... I gave my heart and life to Jesus. Amen. There's a family joke here with the 29 thing, which probably doesn't mean a thing to any of you out there, but Selena's been telling Becky, y'all all know Becky, she runs around here and shakes hands and does whatever she can get away with. But Selena always, her birthday comes up, this year, Selena said she celebrate the uh, 11th anniversary of her 29th birthday. <laughs> so, Becky can't stand it when you say 20. How old are you? You say 29 drives a banana. You know? So, I never associated my salvation until the day I got to thinking about that. I'm going, wow, I was 29, Becky, when I got saved. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. He doesn't care what age you are. He's ca he cares about the condition of your heart. That's what matters to him. You know? Verse number 16. You ever have somebody tell you this is just a book written by man? That's right. Time. You can't believe that. Just written by man. How many authors? Uh, six, uh, six, four, Sixty. Sixty. Forty authors. 40 authors, 66 books, something like that. We're in the ballpark. Y'all get the message. Okay. So, verse 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. How many of you like those words? Doctrine's good stuff. Amen. Reproof, reproofs, good stuff. Amen. Correction. Mm. I mean, if you like that. <laughs> Hold on, preacher. <laughs> Don't be telling me there's something wrong with me. Come on. I mean, what do you mean? Who do you think you are? Joe A messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Saved by grace through faith in Jesus. That's, That's who I think I am. Right. I'm a child of the Most High God. That doesn't make me any better or any worse than you. That's right. You hear me? We're all in this thing together. Amen. But for the grace of God, we'd all be lost. That's right. It's because Amen. of the price that He paid at Calvary. You know? Amen. That's what makes us special. Amen. We're made the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Not my righteousness. There's something I've always tried to do that was instilled in me as a young man. My dad and my uncle that lived next door, they both told me, they said, boy, if you say something, mean it. Say what you mean, mean what you say. That was instilled in me as a young man. You know what? That didn't make me a Christian. When I was 29, I went down to that altar when that man made his altar call and I got down on my knees. And I said, here I am, Lord. Whatever you want to do with me, 
Use my life to your glory. This past December was 35 years. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Serving God. Not always happy about it. <laughs> you know, I've been corrected. I've been through trials. How many of you have been through trials and you think, man, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. Come on. And, you know, you just get bombarded. The devil's hitting you with everything he's got to keep you down, to keep you from serving God, to keep you from being focused on what God wants for you to do, what God wants for you to learn, the things that God is asking you to do in your life. How many of you witnessed on the job? I didn't, nobody has to raise their hands. I'm going to throw questions out there. Don't worry about it. God knows what you do. How many of you in the supermarket? How many of you in CVS? I walked in there about three weeks ago, and the lady behind the counter was talking to a friend that evidently she went to church with. I don't know her name. And she's talking to me. He goes, how you feel? I said, not so good. She said, you can pray for him. And good. the guy said, okay. And he walked off. Now, this is going to sound strange, but I'm going to straighten it out. Just give me a few seconds. So, when the guy walks off, I'm up to the counter next. <laughs> and I look at the lady. And uh, I said, can I lay hands on you? I I'd like to pray for you. I don't, don't, don't take me wrong. I want to pray for you. And she looked at me for a minute. And I said, look, I just want to touch you. Just your hand. That's it. And right there were people in line. I prayed well, that pharmacist Amen. and CVS, I didn't care who was looking at me. Amen. I'm not ashamed of the gospel Amen. of Christ. Amen. It's the power of salvation and the God of them which believe. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. It doesn't matter where you are. I met a friend of mine that I used to play music with back in the days when we did the ballroom thing and we were in Canada's. And he said, what you doing? I said, I'm preaching Jesus. He said, what you doing? He said, I run a ballroom and play music. He said, it looks like we keep one another working. I said, I guess we do. And we're still friends today. I don't turn my back on him because he's not serving God. You know, what does it say? He didn't come to save the sick, to heal the sick. You know, he came to those that need him. Those that need to be touching their spirit and their body. That's who he came after. If you just reach out to the people in the church, guess what? You're not doing your job. Amen, amen. Hello? Everybody in here, whether you... Music ministry, I got thrown into that right out the gate. Because if any of y'all knew Sister Toot, some of you in here did. When you walked in and you told her that you could sing or play an instrument, I've been faking it for a lot of years. <laughs> but she get up here. Uh -huh. Come on and sing. And she brings you up there. And then she says, you want to preach? I'm not a preacher. You got the next service. Okay? <laughs> That's how that lady pushed people along in ministry. It was just the way she was. You had to, you had to be prepared at a moment's notice. Amen. You know? If you walked in the church, she'd always start off with, who wants to pray today? And if you slouched in the chair, you pray. There wasn't no getting away from it. You pray. But it causes you to grow. Amen. Because the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Thank God for who He is and what He's doing in our lives, y'all. Yes. I'm so thankful that I'm not the same man I was 35 years ago. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm still pushing. I'm still striving. I want to serve the Lord with all my heart. And I want to touch as many people as I possibly can to make a difference in this world. There's enough people out there that are wanting to jump off of rooftops and take guns and do whatever they want to check out because they don't want to deal with the issues in this world today. God help us to never get to that point. That we always have hope. Jesus said Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. We got something to look for far beyond what we experience right here and right now. Amen. And this is nothing compared to what God has prepared for us. You know what? People get all excited. Man, I got, a, I got this gold ring. It's however many carats. You know what people consider precious gold? 
We're going to use for pavement in heaven to walk on streets of glory. It's going to be nothing but what we use asphalt down here, concrete, you know. What's such a big deal about a piece of gold? When God says, I just walk on that stuff, it don't mean nothing. Your heart, your life, where you spend eternity, that means something to God. Amen. He created mankind knowing that he was going to give them an opportunity. How many of you know that God could have created robots? That's right. Robotics is a big deal these days. The company I work for built a robot that's up on the space uh, station. The dexterity in that thing, every knuckle on the fingers is just like you and me. That's robotics. When you can get a robot to move one joint, do this or do that. If God would have created robots, he wouldn't have had anybody to love him. If you want somebody to love Amen. him for who he is, he's not going to make you love him. That's right. You have to choose to love him. You have to choose to serve him. It's your choice. Amen. Nobody else's. You know, when I first got saved, I wanted to beat people with this book. Hey, man, look what I got. Why you don't want? Bam! Not really. I never hit anybody. But, you know, I was that excited because I was so excited about living for God. And I couldn't understand why don't these people want to serve God? Didn't make any sense to me. But you know what? To everything, there was a time, there was a season, a purpose for everything under the sun. In God's time. You know, we get all wrapped up and worried and bent out of shape and wonder when certain things are going to happen. It's going to happen when God's ready. I don't care what you do. It's going to happen when God's ready. Y'all know that God answers every prayer you pray? Yeah. There's only one problem that people don't like sometimes. His answer is no. Because he knows that if he gives you what you're asking for, it's going to cause you more misery than you want to deal with. Mm. And God says, no, not right now. Maybe later, but not right now. Sometimes God says no for your own good. If you're a parent, you can relate to that. Dad, can I go to such a... No. Why? Because I said so, I'm a daddy. Y'all ever say that? That's okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> My kids can testify to that. They're sitting over here. Why can't I go, Dad? Because I'm a daddy. You're not old enough to make that decision as far as I'm concerned. I've made the decision. You know what? I think they still love me. <laughs> After all these years, they still love me. Even though I told them no from time to time. Maybe more than from time to time. But I love them just as much as I possibly can. You know, what they mean to me, I can't describe in words. They're special. Let me quit before I start crying. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 12 and 16, though we went to uh, 3. 3, 16, 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For teaching you to do the right thing. That's what this book is for. It's not to sit on the shelf and collect dust. It's not to say, man... I got this Bible, I got that. If you come to my house, and I'm sure a lot of you have been serving God any length of time or the same way, I've got a stack of Bibles, I don't know, I can't tell you how long it is on this bookshelf. You know, Schofield, Thompson, you name it. Most of them are King James. And I got New uh, International, New Living, I don't remember. I bought so many, I can't tell you what I got up there. But this, K KJV, is my standard. Because if I read something in another translation, I'm going, wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. I go back to this. Amen. This book, I base every other one that I read, and they're not a whole, like I say, I don't usually uh, stick with them too long because I can quote this. That new stuff, I can't quote it. But this I know. 
because it's been drilled into me for so many years. I've listened to preacher after preacher preach the Word of God from the King James Version. I'm not telling you it's perfect. If my facts are right, y'all can check this out later, I believe there are over 600 words that are misinterpreted in here. Doesn't that freak you out? But as far as I'm concerned, it's the closest thing they got. Because some of that other stuff, you know, it takes you somewhere else. That scares some people. But it's not a mistake. I tell you what. This book right here. Don't you believe that the God we serve that created the heavens and the earth is more than powerful enough to keep his word together where you get what you need out of it. It said, give us this day our daily bread. You get it out of here. I believe he knows who translated and how they translated. It's inspired by God. That's Amen. what it says. I didn't write that. It's in there. Amen. It's the word of God. Ephesians chapter 5. That's on page 1606. Now some of this I use in a wedding and I'm just going to use a small portion of it because I'm not doing a wedding. <laughs> but there's a, a, a few verses down that we need to see that directly addresses the church. Now the ladies are going to love verse 25. Ephesians 5 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How many of you wives like that one? He said, you need to be willing to lay down your life for your wife because that's what Jesus did for the church. That's what it says. Not a lot of people like to uh, take that and go, what do you mean? I got to love her like Jesus loved the church. Yeah. She's your wife, says the two shall become one flesh. Says no man ever hated his own self. He loves himself. So your wife is just important to God as you are because you're one flesh. That's not where I'm going. I'm going. That's laying you out. Husband loves your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the water of the washing. Washing of the water by the word. What did I say earlier? Study to show thyself approved. How are you going to take a spiritual bath? Any of you ever look at it like that when you read this scripture? How are you going to take a spiritual bath? With the washing of the water by the word. How are you going to clean up the things in your life that aren't right? With the washing of the water by the word. Watch what the next portion of this verse says. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. God's going to clean up you and me as we study this book. But you know what? If it sits on the shelf, it's just collecting dust and it's doing absolutely no good. Let me use a simple analogy. My son just bought this new guitar. I don't know how many of you are guitar buffs, but we are. Man, we look at that thing and we go, Son! <laughs> You know how much good that guitar good does if he doesn't pick it up and strum it or pick out a note? None. It doesn't make music. It doesn't accomplish what it was intended for when it was built. When God created you and I, it says he knew us when we were in our mother's womb. Before we were born, God knew us. But if we don't get in here, study this book, find out what it says and apply it to our lives, then we could be just like that thing sitting in a corner collecting dust and not getting anything out of it. That's right. I believe God's called everybody in the ministry. Amen. You may not get up in the pulpit, 
You may not get out on the street corner. You may not go to New Orleans and preach on Bourbon Street like some people I know. Don't point at Matt, no. <laughs> Matt would do that. Matt does that. Has done it. But some way, shape, or form, God wants to use you to His glory. For His glory, not yours. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Let's talk about Jesus. King of kings is He, Lord of lords. Let's talk about Him. How are people going to know where you're coming from? And I'm going to go one step further with that. You can talk about Him all day long, but if your actions do not reflect what you're talking, guess what? People aren't going to take you seriously. I'm going to go back to Becky again. Matt says he likes to use his kids. I do the same thing to mine. There was a couple sitting over here this morning. So Becky goes, I won't preach tonight. <laughs> they look at her, what you going to preach on? And sometimes her speech is clear, certain words, other words it's not. So she said, sin and hypocrites. <laughs> so, the people look at me, they caught the sin, but they didn't catch the hypocrite part. And they're going, what did she say? I said, hypocrites. Okay. Now, I don't know how they took it. But <laughs> you know, there's a difference between playing church and being the church, y'all. You can walk through those days every time there's walk through those doors every time there's a service and still not be serving God. Just because you stand up in the garage, a fancy garage, it doesn't make you a Mercedes Benz. You know? You have to change your life. You have to submit to God and let Him do what He wants to do. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go back to Titus, right where we started, chapter 1. For this cause left I the decree that you should set in order the things that are warning. Set in order the things that are warning. Paul, you want to come play something? If you would, please. I don't know what Matt had in mind here tonight, but I don't ever like to close a church service without giving an altar call. And I don't know how long I've been preaching. I don't look at a clock. When it's time to stop, it's time to stop. Let God be God. Let God have His way. Set in order the things that are lacking. I don't know about you, but tonight I'm standing in the need of prayer. Because there are things in my life that need to change. And if you want, a, want prayer tonight... I'll pray for you. The pastor's going to come up here, pray for you.